Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in our Flex Your Power series. Um, by way of background, this series has been designed to engage with the local Flex provider community and also to provide more information and insight on the potential value that can be unlocked by participating in local Flex markets. Um, and we've also invited a number of folks along to the series to share their top tips as an experienced FSPs who've engaged with these markets before. At the end of this session today, we'll be hosting a detailed Q&A, so please add your questions into the chat and we'll make sure that we address them after the final presentation. Um, and by way of intro, the last thing I have to say is this webinar has been co-organized co with the help of the ADE. Um, and with that, I'll hand you over to Sarah Honan, who's going to be giving us a markets and policy overview. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Mike. Um, yes, so for any of you who don't know me, um, I am Sarah Honan and I am the Flexibility Policy Manager at the Association for Decentralised Energy. So we're a trade association representing a large portion of the flexibility provider market, including independent aggregators and also suppliers um, and solutions providers like Pickle. We also have an industrial policy work stream. So a lot of the focus obviously here today is going to be on industrial and commercial demand side response or DSR. So I'm here to just give you a very, very high level broad overview, both of the current setup of electricity markets. For many of you, this will be absolute second nature, but I know for some of you, this might be quite alien. Um, and then go on to give you kind of an overview again of where the policy landscape sits and all of the different policy work streams that are going on at the moment that um, the ADE are working on and the flex sector as a whole needs to be concerned about. So next slide. So this is a very, very simple um, timeline of how electricity is bought and sold in Great Britain all the way from four years ahead of delivery, and when I say delivery, when electricity is actually used, to real time um, or seconds ahead of delivery. So at the four year time scale, we have the capacity market, which is somewhat a misnomer in that there's only one buyer and it's the government. So that is to make sure we have sufficient kind of reserve capacity uh, on the system as we transition to intermittent renewables. So there's a auction four years ahead of delivery. This allows new build plant to have time to deliver to come up with the capacity. And then we have the T minus one auction. So that happens one year ahead of time. And historically, that's actually been quite welcoming and quite useful for an indu for industrial and commercial DSR. I've heard people uh, describe it as the gateway drug to flexibility. So we already have a lot of industrial and commercial plant in the T minus one auctions, which happen year on year. Now, one of the issues there is that you're not guaranteed a contract be beyond the delivery year. So one of the things we've been pushing for, for many, many years and government are about to bring in is three year contracts for low carbon, low capital expenditure or CapEx plant. So this means you could go into the T minus one and if you're an industrial and commercial plant, you could get a three year contract, which obviously provides a lot more revenue certainty for participants. When we start to get much, much closer to real time, um, either kind of six months ahead, three months ahead, down to one day, we have a DNO or distribution network operator, reserve services and flex services, which I know Mike is going to be talking a bit more about. So I'll leave that in his capable hands. And then going right up to day ahead and day of delivery, we then have balancing markets, both at the distribution level and at the transmission level. The electricity system operator runs the transmission level ones and the DNOs run the distribution level ones. So one of the newest ones there is the ESO's local constraints market, the LCM at the B4, B6 boundary, which is pretty much just dividing Scotland and England. And this will largely is largely being used as a demand turn up service in order to kind of mop up some of the excess uh, renewable energy being produced in Scotland that's coming into some bottlenecks at those boundary points. 
Then day ahead as well, ESO procure what are called ancillary services. So both frequency response services and reserve services. And this is so they can have some things essentially on standby in case they need it at time of delivery um, in the intraday stage. And underpinning all of those markets, which are kind of about balancing or making sure that the system is functioning in a secure and safe way, we have the wholesale market, both the forward market and the day ahead and intraday markets. This is by far the largest um, the largest market we have for trading electricity. And at the moment, it's only open to suppliers, uh, suppliers, generators and financial traders. But Ofgem have just produced a decision that means independent flex providers uh, will be allowed into the wholesale market starting about, we're hoping, November 2024. Um, so that is usually largely bilateral trading uh, in forward markets, but we expect flexibility to probably be playing in the day ahead and intraday spot exchanges for wholesale market power. Then up until one hour ahead of delivery, we come to gate closure. So everyone stops trading in the wholesale market and that's when the ESO and the balancing mechanism really kick in to start balancing energy and the system in real time. And that's just on a constant basis. So then electricity is delivered. So these are all the markets we have at the moment. As I said, industrial and commercial DSR plays a lot in the capacity market T minus one. There's also opportunities in the DNO services, as Mike will talk you through. There is definitely opportunities for LCM, although it's a nascent service. And it has also historically participated in one of the mainly um, one of the ESO reserve services, which is short term operating reserve or store. Also participating in the BM, but there are some structural issues there that are being ironed out um, by ESO over the next few years. But hopefully once that is done, uh, it will be a much more welcoming market. So next slide. This is a high level kind of map of all of the policies that are impacting the flex sector at the moment on an axis of urgency, i.e. our window to influence them and the impact on the sector. So I'll focus on kind of two to three big ones uh, in the high urgency, high impact frame, which is SES or the Smart and Secure Electricity Systems um, team in Desnes. And I do realise that this slide is essentially acronym bingo. But we are soon to regulate um, and license flexibility providers for the first time. Uh, they're being called load controllers. The other thing about flex, if you're very new to it, there is a thousand different names for what a flexibility provider is. So they'll be licensed uh, under powers given to the Secretary of State under the Energy Act, and they will also be um, regulating energy smart appliances or ESAs to have minimum smart standards. It's important to note here that at present, Desnes is not looking to specifically target flexibility providers for industrial and commercial customers, but rather is focusing on kind of domestic flex providers for that licensing. But that is very much still, you know, it's still a possibility that they will go towards industrial and commercial providers as well. Then we also have the review of electricity market arrangements, REMA, which means the whole previous slide, depending on what they decide in REMA, could be blown up. Um, it's unlikely that it'll be blown up, but it's a possibility. Um, it's the largest, largest review of electricity market um, functioning in well over a decade. And it's about to come into its second consultation. Its first was in June 2022. So we're expecting that in government winter, although I believe it was meant to be government autumn, but hopefully before Christmas. And then finally, you'll notice that I didn't mention what many of you may have first heard about with flexibility, which is the Demand Flexibility Service or DFS. This is because this isn't what we would consider an in-market service. It's an enhanced service by the ESO, which was created last year. And the AD has been doing a lot of work with other trade associations for 
uh, energy intensive industries in order to increase the industrial and commercial participation in DFS this year. Because we know it was a mi- it was a minority last year, whereas really given the history of industrial and commercial DSR to date, it should be, you know, holding its own in the DFS market. Um, so there's one thing you can go look for is there's an open letter to businesses on the ESO website explaining the benefits of DFS. Number one really being that there's no penalties. So it's it's a win-win situation essentially to participate in it. But you do have to be careful around um, you can't be participating in any other uh, flexibility markets. So that is something to be aware of. And then finally, I'll just say a word on the FSO. So the future system operator, the ESO is evolving into the FSO. Again, under powers given to the Secretary of State and the Energy Act, the ESO will become a public body that has far broader powers in relation to strategy and system planning than it currently does. And that's going to be quite a massive cultural shift that at least from our perspective demands much more stringent requirements for transparency and accountability than we see with today's ESO. So that's something to keep in mind. I think that's essentially me. So I will throw back to Mike. Sarah, thank you very much. Really insightful session. And for folks who either joined partway through or if anyone had questions, please make sure you put them in the chat and we'll uh, and we'll tackle them at the end of, at the end of the session. Um, before I move on, I realized I didn't introduce myself. So I'm Mike Strahlman, uh, Senior Vice President at Piclo. I look after our market operations team, which essentially looks at how we run and manage the competitions and also engage with flex providers across across our markets. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Next slide, please. So where does Piccolo fit into this whole process? Well, Piccolo is an independent flexibility marketplace. Our product hosts the flexibility procurement requirements of our system and network operators, and we call these competitions. And we provide an interface for flex providers to bid in or participate in these competitions. What this means practically is we provide visibility into these competitions for flex providers or actors in, in the market. And then modules of our platform allow for a system operator to either procure or then dispatch and settle flexibility that's contracted by the platform. On top of the platform itself, Piccolo provides a customer support experience and guidance for flex providers, as well as training and onboarding support for anyone who participates in the market. So any questions and things that come through, we use our ecosystem and our tools in order to support you along that journey. Uh, Next slide, please. Who are we as a business? Piccolo is a mission-driven company, and, and our objective is to decarbonize energy grids worldwide. Um, whilst our flagship market is in the UK, we have clients across six countries. Uh, some of our clients include Enel in Italy, uh, National Grid in the US, uh, Scottish Power Energy Network in the UK, Eredesh in Portugal, and a number of other customers, and of course, the, the, the folks in the UK. Um, our platform currently manages the flexibility uh, services and constraints for the majority of UK DNOs as well as the local constraint market with the ESO. Um, and as the market leading platform to date, the Piccolo Flex marketplace has supported the procurement of over 2.6 gigawatts of flex capacity, uh, valued at around 74 million pounds over our lifetime. Um, on top of that, we host one of the largest databases of engaged flex providers with over 60,000 registered assets and a total capacity of 19 gigawatts. Um, and actually this segues pretty nicely into the next slide, which talks about the current opportunities in the flex market in the UK. So if you jump across. So this is the this is the real piece that we wanted to engage this audience about, certainly from the Piccolo side, to really highlight the opportunities and the scale of what's happening in the UK market right now. So this year's autumn and winter competitions are bigger than ever, um, with over 1.5 gigawatts being procured and with an estimated value of around 27 million across thousands of individual locations in the market. The, uh, the opportunities are live right now and are open for all flex providers to register and to see if they can qualify and then to participate if you can. Um, Piccolo and the system or network operators are here to support you every step of the way. And at the end of the presentation, there will be information provided to you around how you can book a demo with us to really engage with how the platform works and see how you can participate. But suffice to say, there is a lot of value in the market for flex providers today and a lot of procurement opportunities out there 
in order to engage your asset and to participate in this marketplace. There are quite a few details on this slide, so I would encourage you to try to absorb it, but basically qualification is open or is opening soon. In fact, it's open across all of these three areas for ENWL, UK Power Networks, and SPEN. Um, and qualification closes in a number of weeks for UK Power Networks, but then over the next month or so for the, uh, for, for the other markets. So really a call to action as well for our folks on the phone who haven't registered yet to really get, get involved and see if you can participate in these competitions. Uh, next slide, please. So where can you find more information? Um, we, you know, we have a number of different ways to do that on our, on our website, but essentially we have profiles for the individual system operator or, or network operators, and you can dig into where, what the competition demographics are, also locations on our map, et cetera. Um, and then there are also links to the system operator websites to provide more information and details around the technicalities and the requirements for each of these competitions. Um, and then of course you can get in contact with us and our customer support team in order to in order to learn more and really engage in the platform, as well as have answers around the competitions and, and how you can participate. Uh, next slide, please. So look, that, that's really the end of what I wanted to say. Again, hopefully there are more questions in more detail, but I'd like to hand you over to one of our experienced FSPs, um, Louis from Cub. And he's actually one of the most successful FSPs in our in our market and engaging with these markets. So, Louis, over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Louis Fairfax, Managing Director of Cub UK. And um, I've been in the industry now for my sins for coming up to 18 years. So, uh, been around for a while. Um, the business has been around for longer. So I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into Cub, um, into what we've done with Piclo, and into the, I guess, opportunities that um, Flex and, and providing Flex for your assets or your organisation can can bring uh, to the table. So um, just in terms of background on Cub, first of all, so we are traditionally an energy energy broker, so energy consultant, TPI. I'm sure you'll have heard of one of those terms. Um, in our marketplace, things have become, I guess, more and more challenging to sort of set ourselves apart and be and be different. Um, so an aspect of getting involved in this market was to to branch out. Um, but predominantly, my passion is about helping our customers. So I saw an opportunity to say, hey, look, we've we've got an opportunity to to build some revenue for our customers um, and help them tap into something that actually in many cases they're already doing. Um, so we've moved away from just being a traditional energy broker and just managing supply contracts, but using the benefits that that, that side of our business has and bringing it into flexibility. And yeah, next year it'll be uh, 30 years in business for Cubs. So um, we've, we've come a long way and a long way to go in the future, I'm sure. Um, so historically our, our kind of experience with, with flex or, or demand side response, whatever you want to term it, was mainly around helping our customers avoid charges. So advising them on the appropriate supply contract structure to pass through certain costs and therefore use their um, flexibility within their processes to avoid costs, namely triad charges and red band duos were the, were the key ones. Um, we did that from about 2013 to Come up to 10 years, which we've now seen the end of, of triads and a bit of a um, bit of a change in regards to the cost structure on, on the duos charges as well. So over that period of time, we probably generated something in the region of 10 million pounds in terms of uh, savings for our customers. Um, we're not a huge organization. We've got something in the region of 400 customers. So for our clients, that's quite significant. Um, and on the back of that, then that led into there's a big gap to fill with the uh, triad benefit ending this year. Um, I'm aware we're taking questions at the end, so if any of this stuff doesn't mean anything to you, and you want to know more, then fire it away uh, at the end to us by all means. <clears throat> In terms of, yeah, from what happened from there, we got involved with um, the capacity market, uh, as Sarah alluded to earlier on. Um, Frequency and wholesale market optimization. We've done some stuff, but we've done that all through historically through other parties. Um, 
And then last year, with the uh, setup implementation of the ESO DFS service, Demand Flexibility Service, we kind of bit the bullet and said, look, we can do this ourselves um, and we can actually uh, go ahead and access these flexibility markets for our customers and give them the biggest benefit without someone else taking a chunk of it effectively. Um, so we set up the what we call the Cub Reduction Reward Scheme, which is the name of everything that it encompasses our flexibility services. Um, and then from there, we delivered DFS throughout last winter um, and generated a, a good chunk of income for uh, some of our clients. One of our customers, uh, which you know they ge they generate a bottom line profit of circa kind of 200k a year we delivered 80k just over the winter for them so a significant amount of income and our customers manage their flexibility very traditionally and that is purely demand turndown so we we don't operate um it, it, we don't operate sort of systems and processes and automation it's purely a call to turn down power and traditionally someone's going ahead and flicking a switch or or running a program to make sure that they can do that from their side um and then yeah with piclo we, i'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide but bring this a bit more up to speed we successfully won a, our first tender for local flex with ukpn through piclo um and then we were proud to take part in the uh, LCM trial for, for ESO as well this year. So that was demand turn up for a couple of assets up in Scotland. Uh, next slide, please, Apana. So, yeah, in terms of the uh, involvement with, with Piclo and, and, and our sort of local DSO stuff predominantly, um, it's fair to say that I I wouldn't have even been aware of the UK PN tender um, when that came through initially. So it, that I think was through some some good uh, good marketing efforts on on your part, Mike, and your team. Um, so uh, some pick some stuff up from LinkedIn, uh, and and really for me it was a case of hey look, there's a there's a place we can go that 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 pulls all this information together. Wow, that's quite a that's quite a helpful tool first of all, um, and then we used one of our most flexible assets which is a plastic recycling company who used to avoid those peak hour charges so they use less power between the hours of four and seven and they did that predominantly through scheduling their maintenance in, in those periods so quite simply that activity was kind of happening anyway and they'd respond to a, a tried alert usually within day they'd get an alert from about sort of 10 o'clock and they'd power down at, at various points in time between four and seven predominantly as i said for that particular day so what did we do with that asset um we uploaded it initially onto the piccolo flex platform and i then went away and used the um publicly available pricing information to assess okay well what sort of level could I bid at for that particular tender? Um, and then thankfully successfully achieved our first uh, contract award through UKPN for that INC asset. Um, and the income generated from that was just predominantly on three particular months over, over a three year period where they have the, the, the biggest requirement in that, in that constraint zone. Uh, and for that customer, we generated 32k of income, which isn't a huge amount, but for them, that activity is happening anyway. So it's a kind of added bonus um, for, for their already existing industrial processes. Um, and then activity as of now, we're just in the process of responding to the UK PN tender that, that Mike alluded to in, in his slides. And, and key area of focus for us, our business and our customers uh, is the is the demand turn up stuff. So as I mentioned, we've we've had activity in LCM and we're looking to participate in the UK PN constraint zones where they need customers to turn power up at certain times and we've got assets across the UK PN area that we can participate with there. Uh, next slide, please, partner. Um, so yeah, uh, to summarise some of the, the sort of tips, I, I suppose in terms of of our involvement to date, um, 
I'm super passionate about flexibility. You know, I, I uh, from when we first started managing the, the sort of triad stuff and red band stuff, it was an area that seemed a bit of a no brainer to me in terms of us all helping each other, helping the grid to balance and and helping the the, the path to net zero and, and and the system and everyone to become greener. So I, I guess for me already, I, I was aware of the opportunity that was there from a sort of nice touchy feely perspective, but also then looking at the numbers and the, and the generation of income from our clients perspective, which was the key driver for me. It's a relatively, I, I guess, immature market in, in many ways, but the opportunities are growing and the um, the market's maturing quickly. So we're keen to stay at the forefront of things. Um, and, and And really, it's just a case of looking at, at what that would hold speaking to the right people and and, and understanding what that could bring to your organization um, in terms of using the piccolo platform we've kind of now got around to um after several pounding emails from the guys at piccolo to getting a load of our assets up on there um it, doing that makes sense because it's then a case of they're pushing the opportunities to us as opposed to us looking at that the other way around um, let Piccolo do the hard work for you. Um, I mentioned the publicly available pricing information through the uh, data hub that's available on Piccolo. Super helpful. It's I think having worked in the energy industry since 2005, where there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, in my opinion, and a, and a lot of sort of unknowns around you know pricing and 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 things are difficult to get hold of. It's nice to have something that it explicitly states tenders one prices and so on and so forth and it's a it's a useful tool as i mentioned and make sure you use that um depending on what type of assets you're working with as an organization or if you you know you, you are an asset yourself it's taking the time to 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 understand the benefits of flexibility there's a load of resource out there mike's obviously shared shared some of that information and uh there's a lot of helpful people in the market um, I've been involved with the ENO Open Networks Forum, um, and some of the guys there are really helpful. And there's uh, inordinate amounts of, of information you can get access to to really understand what that could mean to you and your organisation. And I guess as well, start small. So last year we had 150 MPANs in DFS, um, and those then carried through into opportunities for uh, for the local flex. We then this year should grow that by about tenfold or being well. Um, but we, we we deliberately started small. I deliberately only went ahead and accessed the market for one asset for the UK PN tender just to run that process through and understand it and what it means for us and where the pinch points are. Um, and it, it, yeah, for me, that's that's worked really well. So, uh, yeah, I think that's probably Pretty much it from from me in terms of um, the the sort of uh, track record of Cub and, and what have you. Happy to take any any questions at the end. Um, and I guess just sorry, one more thing is that in terms of the opportunity, this is squarely the focus for me. As I mentioned, we're we're a business that's been around for thirty years. Um, my plan is that this business will be here be here in thirty years. Um, and whilst the supply contract negotiation side of our business is still strong my aim is squarely focused on flexibility which i think hopefully speaks volumes to the opportunity that there is in flexibility so thank you all for your for your time and uh, as i said take any questions at the end louis thank you very much that's that's a really compelling summary of the you know of the value of flex markets and also your growth as a business and in, in looking at this and i really liked how you you know painted a picture of of Again, starting small, but then understanding that there's lots of opportunity out there and engaging with the platform and loading your assets actually allows allows the value to be pushed towards you, right? The opportunity to be pushed towards you as a business. And I would, again, I would invite participants on the call to do something similar, really to, to, to take a look and see what's out there. So thanks, Louis. Um, next up, uh, I would like to invite Jason from Oak Tree to share some of the Oak Tree experiences of participating in, in local flex competitions. So, Jason, welcome and over to you. 
thank you, Mike, and uh, well, thanks everyone for uh, you know uh, putting some time out of a busy, busy schedule to come and listen to us. Um, so, just a brief introduction. Uh, Jason Avramidis, uh, Director of Innovation and Flexibility Markets uh, for Oak Tree Power. Uh, I see that my camera just went off. Ignore that. Uh, so, uh, my job is to basically look at uh, you know at interesting uh, flexibility market opportunities with a special focus on local flexibility markets, which uh, are now growing uh, very very fast, especially if one considers where we were like five years ago when they were first launched. So, uh, my job is to basically you know uh, monitor all of the interesting opportunities and you know get our clients uh, educated about this, participating in this, and obviously you know making some money for them helping the DSOs manage their system and, you know, obviously produce energy and financial savings. So let's go over into the next slide. So uh, this is just a brief, uh, brief intro about uh, Oak Tree Power, just to give you some key stats. So we were founded about uh, three years ago. Uh, right now we're about 20 people and I would say that we, you know, we're, we've already been quite successful when it comes to, uh, to our growth. We have about uh, a 90 megawatt, por uh, 90 megawatt portfolio across 160 sites in the UK. Uh, we are also expanding uh, quite strongly internationally. Right now we have uh, nine either international pilots or agreements with DSOs and TSOs to basically get flexibility uh, up and moving in Europe. Uh, I would say that we have uh, some one of the most experienced teams in the energy sector. Uh, there is a a, a start down uh, a start down at the bottom uh, saying that uh, obviously not Oak Tree, but uh, our executive uh, team was involved in the construction of the very first virtual power plant in the UK and the very first uh, grid scale battery storage uh, that was delivered. So I would say that in terms of expertise, even though we're a small company, uh, we're let's say that we're up there up up in the in the one percent. So let's go uh, down to the next slide to see basically what um, you know what Oak Tree does. So our main clientele uh, are commercial and industrial buildings that uh, traditionally you know how, uh, were locked out of these markets. They didn't really participate uh, in flexibility or energy management or anything like that. Um, so our job is to basically you know uh, go to these people, talk to them about the potential of energy management, reducing energy uh, reducing energy wastage, and producing energy savings. And then, of course, you know, matching these, uh, you know, as Louis said, uh, most of this process would have been done anyway. So if we can match these with flexibility opportunities, then you can basically unlock two revenue streams for your client. One is uh, from saving, uh, you know, uh, saving money from your energy man from energy management. The other one is uh, earning money from participating in flexibility markets. So the way it works is we basically go to individual buildings, do a preliminary feasibility study to see you know, if there is uh, any energy savings and flexibility potential from, from your building, we put together an asset list and try to quantify that flexibility potential. And, you know, if your building is uh, commercially viable uh, to be transformed into a demand response asset, then we install our technology, our hardware and software at your building, which we call uh, the ACORN. Uh, we uh, internalize all of these costs, so you pay for nothing. And uh, then the way it works is we uh, we implement what we call our load adjustment strategy, and we start generating uh, energy savings and flexibility savings. And we split the revenue, let's say 50, 50, 40, 60, 70, 30, depending on the agreement. And this comes at zero risk to you because the only way for us to, to, to earn money is for you to earn money. So there's absolutely zero risk or zero cost for the business to do this. Uh, let's go into the next slide. I'm very quickly going to go through this. It's just an overview of uh, pretty much every technology that, that, that we can control. As I said, we're, we're doing both commercial and industrial buildings. Our clientele involves, you know, small, you know, small law firms that have a flexibility of like 100 to 150 kilowatts. Where we're con maybe controlling a, an HVAC or a, or a chiller and can go up to 30, 40, 50 megawatts if we're talking about a huge uh, industrial plant. So there's basically a huge range of uh, flexibility that we're responsible for managing. Let's go over to the next slide. Uh, the next slide is uh, so here. Uh, how does the you know the, how does the client transformation process work? As I said, the, the our main let's say barrier to our main barrier is going to clients who are passive and by passive. I don't just mean buildings that don't do engage in energy management or in flexibility. I'm talking about people who have never heard about uh, about the ability to do energy management. and have never heard about flexibility management. So. A very big part of the of the customer's journey is to edu uh, is to educate them and to explain to them that you can do this sort of thing without disrupting your BEU, 
uh, without stopping any of your processes. Like you can actually provide benefits both to the environment and to the grid without actually this being a huge inconvenience um, for you. So from the very first step, which is uh, uh, client education and designing the load adjustment strategy down to the actual uh, monitoring, control, implementation, and then analysis of the performance of the client. We take them by the hand step by step and we transform them to a client who is sophisticated in that they can do uh, energy management and eliminate their energy wastage and to participate in as many flexibility opportunities as are possible because even though, as I said, our focus is local flexibility markets, there is no reason why you can't stack multiple revenues and participate in local flexibility markets and in many national flexibility markets like the capacity market, the demand flexibility service uh, like Luis mentioned, uh, the local constraints market uh, up in the north and everything else that um, that the ESO throws, uh, throws at their plate. So let's go into uh, into the next slide. So this is just a uh, a, a key study that I picked, which I thought was uh, was quite interesting. This is one of our clients, the uh, Financial Times uh, building in London. Uh, and the reason why I picked this is because, as I said, it showcases very uh, very nicely the two revenue streams that we unlock for our clients. So. Uh, on the left, you see uh, load adjustment events that we execute simply for uh, simply to produce environmental savings. So as you can see, for example, uh, in 2022, more than a thousand uh, events of turndown that generated more than 40 grand for the building and a CO2 reduction of 230 tons. So huge environmental benefit and huge financial benefit just for turning down a few devices, maybe a few hours during the day with zero disruption to the BEU, and we were very fortunate to be able to participate in a UKPN tender a few years ago and win a very lucrative long-term five-year contract with UKPN. So our job is to basically provide to UKPN 180 kilowatts uh, of availability for a few hours, for let's say about six to eight hours um, during the summer period, uh, where we usually dispatch maybe uh, either never or, or once a day. Uh, so, so far we've, uh, like for the example, in, uh, in the last summer, we've been providing uh, more than two megawatts of availability and more than one megawatt hour of utilization, uh, helping UKPN, you know, manage, uh, manage their, um, their local system constraints. Uh, and the extra benefit of that is not that you just earn money from participating in flexibility, is that as you will see at the bottom, uh, at the bottom right, there is an extra 22% reduction in your electricity bill. So you don't just Earn money. So, you know, the mere act of participating into the local flexibility market produces an implicit uh, an implicit benefit that no one really thinks about. But like the demand, you know, demand response is, in, in my opinion, the most viable long term option for uh, for local flexibility markets because it is the cleanest low cost solution and, and can produce so many benefits for the environment, the owner of the building and the distribution system operator that you know it's basically a no brainer uh, for you to register and to just keep doing what you're doing help the environment and make money out of it so let's go into uh, in, let's go into our final slide so as louis said this is a this is a you know this is a growing market i would say that it's it's still not as mature as uh, as as we would like it to be uh, but you know there are uh, steps that all of us could take to you know help this market grow and uh, uh, become let's say a, a staple when it comes to uh, power system management. So I, I would say our top tips for actually learning about flexibility markets and participating, I would say that number one is to engage with DNOs regularly and, and keep, you know, keep monitoring and, and studying their network development plans and their demand forecasts because they are quite open, quite transparent about where they're building more network, where they're going to need more flexibility, where the network is constrained. So uh, you can already anticipate many years in advance where there are going to be flexibility needs. Uh, study uh, past market results and participants, so how active the markets were, who participated, how much they bid in for, what technologies participated. This is the best way for you to participate in the market. It's still not competitive enough for you to need a sophisticated trading platform uh, behind your decisions. So, uh, you know, just understanding uh, the particip you know, the participation structure and the logic behind participants can really help you lock in some of the super lucrative contracts instead of users saying, OK, I'm just going to bid in 50,000 because I feel like it or because this is the revenue cap. Um, when you see an upcoming uh, local flex opportunity, maybe six months or a year from now, 
Don't wait till the last minute to register your asset or to get your asset uh, ready. Uh, start, you know, uh, start preparing it. Uh, do some tests. Make sure it works. So when the when the opportunity is, is there, you can just register. You can pass your proving test easily and then offer flexibility. Um, one thing that I think that I don't think anyone um, really talks about is that you really need to engage with pickles in DSOs regularly. They are super eager to help, super eager to 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 share information and to help you participate in the market. Uh, they you know they post on LinkedIn through emails. Uh, they even call you sometimes. So they are really they say really dedicated in getting this thing uh, up and running. So engage with them, and I'm more than confident that they'd be you know they'd be more than happy to uh, to help you get your assets over the line and participate as well. And uh, the last thing, which is let's say it's not a specific tip, it's more of a general recommendation that you know you can't just wait for, for you know for the local flex market to magically develop somehow. The only way this is going to happen is if both sides uh, push for it. So if the DSO listens to customer feedback and makes adjustments, and if customers participate, register, offer flexibility, bid into the market, engage in consultations, talk to Piclo, talk to the DNO. And help them co-develop the market because remember it's not the dso just building the market it's both the dso and flexibility providers coming together and building the marketplace and the and the trading framework that we all want to uh to see so i guess that's uh that's a basic overview of oak tree our experience in flex markets and our top tips and uh you know if there are any questions i'm happy to take them uh, at the end thank you Jason, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I really liked the concrete example and the both not only the linking of the of the the value, but also the environmental benefits, as well as this implicit benefit of cost saving. And then I really it resonated with me that final point you were making around just get involved now to help grow the market. And it's it's really participation now that's going to help make this a mainstay of what of what we need in managing and managing the grid requirements in local markets. Just check here. OK, we've had one comment come through in the chat. I'm just going to read it out and then we can then we can try to uh, to to address it. So one issue that I've had is when I've reached out to DSOs to try to build a relationship. Often I get signposted to a bunch of background information such as the optimized prime project or other case studies and data or the, the, connect, the connections team. But that isn't really what I'm looking for. If you got any advice for attracting the attention of DSOs and building a working relationship or alternative if they're not equipped to do this. Um, appreciate the comment coming through. Um, Louie or Jason, do you want to give in, in any comments against that? And then I can also give my advice. Um, just just to say, it surprises me quite quite a lot, actually. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't had that, but I, I I don't know who. I'm sort of guessing at who the um, DSO may or may not be. Um, happy to ruth if you want to reach out to me happy to, to make any introductions i've spoken to all the dso's i've got contacts there with all of them um so happy to to make an introduction um to to try and sort of marry things up if that would help um if not yeah i guess um reach out to, to you got guys at pick like mike um because again you've got contacts there as well uh, for most of them, and um, I'm sure between us we could we could make something work. I'm always happy to talk about flexibility, so if you can just chat on the phone, if I'm not helpful, then then sorry, but <laughs> I'll do my best. I think I would just add to that that I think it really, in a nice way, it depends what the question is. But we're we're, we're at Piccolo, we're also very happy to support and and guide guide you on if it's a technical question or if it's a question about about the, our product or about how you engage with the market. Um, so we're, we're equipped to do that. Um, and otherwise, we can help direct traffic to the right folks at the, at the DNOs or DSOs um, to help you out there. So please do just get in touch directly with us and as well, and we'll, we'll help you sort of route that. Jason, did you want to say anything about that? Yes, uh, I want to say to, to Ruth and to Mike, who just left a similar comment that uh, I absolutely feel your pain, uh, because uh, one thing that I will say is that to add to Luis's point, there is definitely some inconsistency in the experience uh, that local flexibility providers face when engaging with uh, with different DSOs. I would say that, you know, some DSOs are quite good at that. The others, you know, are still uh, are still improving. Um, so this may, you know, this kind of advice may seem a bit um, wild in a sense, but I think that the the best way for you to do is to 
keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, uh, try to find the right people, engage with the DSOs uh, through all possible channels. Like, for example, I have found that consultations are a very effective way of communicating with DSOs, especially um, if you have grievances with them and you're explicit about them. I've seen that, uh, you know, this tends to, to, to generate quite a lot of buzz. Uh, I, I can tell you personally that uh, I'm because you know because local flexibility markets are quite close to my heart i've been in local flexibility for like seven years now uh both in research and in industry so i really want to see this thing succeeding so when the dso's are not uh, let's say performing up to the standards that they should be performing in my opinion i call them out and i have seen that you know when someone is quite negative about their uh, their experience you know it's gonna get flagged into the system and someone is gonna get back to you so being honest and you know pushing and uh, basically you know trying to be as active as possible is the best strategy uh, I found. And again, if one person isn't willing to help you, I promise you there is someone else who is will, who will be willing to help you. So my let's say best general advice is don't give up. Uh, as Louis said, there are also ad other mediums of work of communicating with DSOs, like you can reach out to an aggregator or to or to a trade you know or to a trade organization that they would be happy to put you into contact with them. But uh, if you want to, you know, do it yourself, in some cases, it does need some some effort. That's that, that's all I'm going to say. Ruth and, and Mike, I just just seeing the comments coming through, I would just I definitely invite both of you to just get in touch with with me or the team here at Piclo to, to understand a bit more about what's going on and we can help diagnose and, and support rooting you in the right direction. So please, please, please do that and feel free to do so. I think as well, it might be important to say there on kind of Ruth's most recent comment on the forward planning side. So you're absolutely right. Um, and as part of the current price control that started April this year for the DNOs, they have what's called a DSO incentive mechanism. So essentially, DSOs are now being actively incentivized to cost benefit uh, analysis flex markets versus strategic reinforcement of networks so it is absolutely within their best interests to make sure they are properly engaging with potential flex providers because they're essentially going to be rewarded or penalized on it um, by off gem in the price control period so you know if there's anything if, if there's anything the guys here can't uh, help with it's also good to keep an eye out for kind of stakeholder surveys that are about the DSO incentive in particular because that's going to be something that DNOs are judged on thank you Sarah other questions also happy for folks to to speak them out loud otherwise type them in the chat we can address them Don't be shy. Okay, I've got something that's come through. Um, how is the competition in this space viewed, i.e. other platforms, Electron, et cetera? Also, how does the pa panel think all DNOs will be signed up to Piclo in the, in the short or long term. SSEN alluded to their next tender being issued, being on the platform, Piclo platform in 24. Interesting question. So the question is around other platforms in this space and then also everything being joined up. So I can I can take a first go, but then I'd also invite others to, to, to respond. So um so look, I mean the, the the key message from my side is that participation in these markets in whatever form is the, is the ultimate objective that we all have. We want the markets to grow, we want participation to increase, and we want to make sure that 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 flexibility as a as sort of a product or a procurement ecosystem helps to manage grid constraints. Um, and so at the moment in the UK, um, the, the Piclo is covers the majority of 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 the of the UK. DNOs, DSOs, and we hope to continue with that. But in the future, that may not be the case, and if that's a, and that's okay because we want people to participate as as best they can. The ideal scenario, from my perspective, is that is that it's very easy for a flex provider to participate in any market in the UK. 
So that's not just local flex markets, but that's also the ESO markets. That's the other mechanisms that Sarah talked through at the beginning of the presentation. And the, the idea is to create an ecosystem and a mechanism by which flex providers can, can participate in those markets as easily as possible. And at, at Piccolo, that's something we're working on, but I'm also confident that others in the ecosystem are, are thinking about this as well. And I invite that. I think that's the, that's the right direction to travel. Um, I'm sure Sarah can speak to and respond to the regulatory or the policy perspective and where this is going. Maybe I'll ask you to jump in and share your views. Absolutely. So I think with this, um, there's a lot going on at the moment in off gems. I think it's they've never named themselves the flexible strategy team. Um, and they're looking into digitalization, the idea of centralized data sharing platforms, because you're right, there is a lot of disparate um, ways to participate out there. And it's really still up for debate about whether you know, there should be one marketplace to rule them all or whether there's room for decentralization and making sure that even if there's multiple platforms, what's most important is that the data flows and signing up to individual markets is as easy as possible, which is obviously what Piclo is doing with the DNO services at the moment. So you don't have to pre-qualify for X amount of different markets. Um. So I think that's one aspect of it. I think the other aspect of data sharing and data reform is with the networks themselves. So we can provide marketplaces, Offgem can regulate how people transfer data, but if the data that network operators are actually looking for in order to participate in flexibility is kind of, may be suitable when designed for a multi-million pound gas plant, but not so suitable for dispersed assets that are aggregated into a portfolio. Those are the kinds of things that say the ADE is really focused on tackling and removing those barriers so that by the time businesses actually approach a flexibility provider or you know, if we're talking domestics, by the time electric vehicles and heat pumps and flexible tech is in homes, we're not just then going, oh, maybe we should make some markets that can actually utilize these assets. Um, having those markets there and ready is kind of essential. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, did anyone else want to respond to that, um, Louis or Jason? Oh, sorry, Jason. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think I think it would be embarrassing if I try to follow up Sarah's uh, Sarah's response. So I'm going to refrain from saying it. I, I echo the same. So yeah, I'm, I think we've covered everything there. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, just just a time check. We have about three or four minutes left of the Q and A, um, and then we'll we'll sort of wrap up. But any other questions coming through, please shoot them across. Otherwise, if not, um, you know how everyone likes awkward silences, right? So I get, I'll, I'll jump straight into wrap up. <laughs> um, and, and listen, folks, please contact me or the team directly and also folks on the line if for any further questions. Um, but first thing I'll say is thanks again to the speakers. So Sarah, Louie and Jason, really appreciate you taking the time to present to us. Um, and before I let you go, I wanted to let you know on top of being able to register and book a demo, et cetera, but we have three more web webinars in this series that are coming up over the next few weeks. So there's uh, EVs and storage on the 23rd of November with the REA. We have wind and storage on the 30th of November with Renewable UK, and we also have domestic demand side response on the 7th of December with Energy UK. So please do feel free to, to come along. You may hear some similar stuff from folks like me at Piccolo, but with different things from different experiences from other participants in the market. So that should be informative. And then if you want to hear more, as I said, please get in touch with us or use the QR code on the screen to book a demo of the platform and just generally chat to us at Piccolo more about flexibility in the market and, and how you can get involved. So thanks very much, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks all. Thank you. Cheers.